Hi, I'm Dan. I'm the owner and skipper of Gossamer Penguin, a 1977 O'Day 22. But that's not why I'm here today. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about the Duster. The Duster was a boat that was designed and built in 1933 by Owen P. Merrill in Riverton, New Jersey. Riverton is where Riverton Yacht Club is, uh -huh. and that's where we race the Penguin. This thing was designed and built for the Riverton Yacht Club in summer. Uh, you've probably, I, I hope you've seen some of the videos, uh, there's not a lot of wind in the summer, so this thing is tiny, it's 14 feet long, it's light, it's only like three, 400 pounds, and it is wildly overpowered for its size. It has a giant mass and a giant boom, it's a cat rig, uh, so the mast is all the way up front, it's just this massive, massive sail on this tiny little boat. They fell out of favor in about the 50s or 60s when things like lasers came out, and uh, they just kind of stopped racing them, and there are no more dusters floating. There's no more sailing dusters at Riverton, New Jersey. Uh, there's one bunch of holdouts up in Lake Naomi in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania, and they do at least one yearly race. Um, it's kind of hard to nail them down. I figure it's kind of a shame to have this piece of Riverton history that isn't active anymore, so I am going to build a duster. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be something. I've never built a boat before, but it was designed by Owen P. Merrill to be built uh, by amateurs using uh, normal sort of everyday stuff in your garage tools huh? and with normal like hardware store type lumber. Everything's by like three quarters by half an inch or inch and a half. And uh, uh, it's, it's all stuff that you can generally get. I'm gonna go and try and make mine last a little bit lo longer. I'm gonna use marine ply, um, but that is for another time. What I'm doing now is I'm building molds. So the molds are uh, set up every two feet on this particular boat, and it's basically the inside shape that the wood for the boat is going to wrap around to make all of the curves and shapes. Um, so let's take a look at the plans and we'll talk about what I'm doing now. So this is sheet number two on the plans for the duster. Uh, you can get a feel for the whole shape of the thing and uh, how it's going to fit together here. Uh, here are the molds that I was talking about. They sit uh, parallel to each other and perpendicular to the ground. We've got one big fat keelson that runs the length of the boat and then on top of all of that is plywood. It's got a flat back and a flat front uh, yeah, uh, cut in about here is going to be a centerboard, which is not in this particular plan. So the molds are what I'm working on now, and I'm going to show you how I'm doing that today. Um, I don't have an actual drawing of each mold, like over here. What I've got is a sort of a construction diagram, how to draw the molds uh, in full size. So we've got a measurement here, S, a measurement here, H, this wide measurement B, and this whole, uh, whole width measurement D. Wacky thing you'll notice is that D comes out to here, but it actually doesn't measure the width of the mold itself. It measures the distance to, between these two um, imaginary points out here that are sort of floating. And this point makes up this line here, but then this, uh, gets figured out in a different way. It's basically uh, straight across from that point and then straight when it bumps into this line, which you construct here uh, by... We'll get there. I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute. But the way you get the different sizes of the molds are down here. This is a table of offsets. <clears throat> Each mold has a number. Uh, starting from the stern, we've got our 2 foot 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. And then um, our transoms are actually the molds for the uh, bow and stern of the boat. So each of these molds has a different set of measurements that's going to make it a different size, which is going to give it this neato curve once it's all laid out on a strong back. Um, haven't built a strong back yet, uh, or ever, and we'll get to that. But what we're going to do today is, um, let's see, I think I've got four, six, 10 and 12 done. So let's see which one is next. Uh, what I did was I actually used these measurements and a scale ruler 
to uh, draw out and then cut out uh, little wood versions, uh, one inch to one foot of the uh, of the molds, and then I laid them on a four inch by eight inch rectangle so that I could see how many of these molds would fit onto one piece of plywood. Unfortunately, only five of the six molds actually fit on a piece of plywood. So we've got, let's see, uh, what did we do? We did four, six, 10, and 12. So we did you, we did you. I think we're gonna cut out mold number two today. So something that you'll see on like, uh, uh, Steve and Alex, um, oh, Acorn to Alabella, or um, Leo over at Samson Boat Co., uh, they loft out the boat. They actually have this full-size drawing, and they have to check it for fair over and over and over and over again until they got the lines as close to perfect as their obsessive uh, uh, little brains can do. The neat thing about a duster is that uh, you actually, it's a one design, so if you make your measurements right, things will just come out fair. And if you get your measurements right, they're all gonna be the same. It's a one design boat. So you just have to measure, draw it right onto the plywood, cut out those molds, and then you know that you're going to turn out a boat that is the right size, fair or not. I'm not gonna to worry too hard about crazy fairness because, well, it's a 14 foot boat and uh, most of it isn't gonna be in the water when it's uh, sailing anyway, so. That's the idea. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, better or worse, it's going to be the only one at Riverton anyway uh, until I build several of them. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how it goes. So we're going to go over to the sawhorse, uh, the, my, my janky, janky sawhorse, and we're going to draw out and then cut out mold number two. Here we go. Okay, so I've cut out four molds from this sheet of plywood so far, and this is all that's left of it, except for a pile of scraps. This edge is not flat, and you kind of need a flat edge in order to make all your measurements so that you know you've got one straight line to be, you know, perpendicular to, and everything's just kind of all square to itself. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use my yardstick, and I'm going to hold it up here, find the high spots and the low spots, and I'm gonna knock down most of it with my big old uh, Craftsman electric planer that I got for 15 bucks at a yard sale. Go to yard sales. And then I'm gonna finish it off with this cute little guy. This is a Stanley, uh, oh shoot, what is it? A 60 and a half low angle block plane. Uh, it is made specifically for going across grain. And since uh, no matter which way you're going on the edge of plywood, you're going across some grain. Uh, this has been a little lifesaver. I love it. Uh, my mom gave it to me for Christmas, and that is super groovy of her. And so, yeah, uh, you'll see me using this to knock everything down to the pencil lines. So, uh, here we go. This is the first part. We're going to uh, knock down this so that it's pretty close to flat. And I'm going to use this to get it really, really flat.
all of the measurements come off, well, no, this isn't true. I was going to say all the measurements come off of a center line, but that's not true. Um, that said, I do need a center line. So uh, it's, a, it's a four foot wide piece of plywood. I'm shooting right down the middle because uh, honestly, this is just plain old hardware store plywood. Uh, it didn't cost me an arm and a leg. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to strike the center line right down the middle at the two foot mark. And this is the line that everything's going to be parallel or perpendicular to. I'm going to make all my measurements and my uh, measurement checks off of this line. So the first measurement uh, is D, okay, and that goes from here to here to those imaginary points we were talking about before. Um, fun thing is that Owen uh, gave us just a total width. He didn't give us a half breadth. So every time you do a D or a B measurement, you have to cut it in half. So D is three foot, nine inches and three quarters. Um, half of that, I had to chop it up. So, you know, foot and a half for our three feet and then four and a half for our nine inches. And then our three quarters goes down to three eighths. All that together makes one foot, 10 inches, seven eighths. This way and that way. And then we'll have our three foot, nine and three quarters. So let's lay that out. One, 10. So that's 22, 22, and 7 eighths. All right? Right. Okay. And same thing on this side. 22 and 7 eighths. And I'm going to sort of... Make a nice light line here because this isn't a line I'm cutting on, it's just a line that I am referencing to make that little invisible bit, that little cross. Uh, and just to check, you can measure this, it should be three, nine, and three quarters. Let's see if my math was right. Three, nine, and well, three, nine, and Three quarters minus a sixteenth. So where did I go wrong? So that's that's a little bit short. So I'm gonna push that out by what is that thirty second? How about you? Where are you? That's a little bit short too. That's short by about a sixteenth. I'm well. No, no, no. Hang on. Help you over. You are short by nothing. You're seven eighths. Okay. So this is short. So we're gonna we're gonna bump you out just a hair. Plus one sixteenth. So add a sixteenth to you. Let's see. Double check your measurements. Okay, so that is the width of D for our imaginary marks. Okay, next measurement is S, and that is up from the bottom edge up to here, and that makes the, uh, the second dimension of our little imaginary point. So we're going up five and a half inches from the bottom edge, so five and a half. That right there is our little imaginary point. I'm going to do it again over here, five and a half. Right there. All right. So the Duster One design, uh, back when it was still a thing in like the 60s, um, it said that every boat had to be uh, within a quarter of an inch on all of its half breaths. That means that uh, overall the boats could vary width-wise by a half an inch in pretty much any dimension. 
uh, I am doing my best to get it to within, you know, a pencil line. So I should be within a 32nd, a 16th, hopefully, if I keep double checking my measurements. And, uh, you know, we should hopefully have, I mean, I've never built a boat before. So saying I'm going to build a perfect duster is kind of a uh, hubris, but I'm going to do my best. I'm going to get it as close as I can. So that's our second measurement. What's next? Okay, next measurement is H, which is 10 and 9 sixteenths, and that is uh, the height from S up to the actual top of the thing. S is the um, actual location of the, uh, the top of the boat, the deck. Um, it's, uh, I get S for shear line, I guess. Everything else is spacing it so that you'll notice on some of the, uh, on some of the molds, especially the smaller ones at the ends, uh, this measurement, this S measurement, is much lower because they sit higher on the boat. We're in the middle, it's a little bit lower, so we can actually build ourselves a nice little shear line. So, the next one, H, is the actual depth of the boat in this cross section, and that is 10 inches and 9 sixteenths. So, we're going to measure that out. So, 10 and that would be 8 sixteenths. That's a half. 9 sixteenths. And that would go right there. So that's where that line is going to shoot across. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, extend that, extend this line up to here and up to here so I can measure that out and stretch my yardstick across it. Looks like a boat, right? Yeah. Alright, let's get a date. Okay, B is two feet, 11 inches, and a quarter. So I chopped that up again, so I got one foot, five and a half, plus an eighth, which is a half of a quarter. And I got one foot, five eight, <laughs> one foot, five and five eighths inches. So I'm going to go that way, and that way, and I should get two 11 and a quarter. So the next thing we do is we draw uh, this line here, so this point, down to our imaginary point. This is actually the line right here that the plywood, our marine plywood, our sides of our boat, is going to ride on for the most part. No, for the whole part. This is what it's going to ride on. But we do have to construct some notches here um, so that our chime log, chime log and our shear clamp can fit in. Uh, we'll talk about construction of those things later. And we're actually at a point where we're building a boat. Because right now we're just building molds, right? All right, there's that line. What's next? All right, so check it out. What I'm trying to do is I need to mark in these little notches here and here. These are where some boards are going to go to hold the boat together. Um, I need to draw a line that's three quarters inch away from this edge right here. And then I need to mark out a notch that is one and a half inches along the inside line, that three-quarter line that I drew over here. And then another line that is, okay, so I need to come straight across from our little imaginary point, our S, and I need to draw a line straight down. That is the edge of our mold. And then I need to make, uh, let's see, I need from that point that I drew right there, I need to go up one and a half inches uh, along my three quarter inch line and then mark that off and go straight up from there and that makes the notch for my shear clamp. I made myself a janky little um, cheat sheet so that I can take that over to the sawhorse on the workbench or whatever you call it and I'm gonna mark those out and then I think we're gonna cut. Okay so everything keys off of that three quarter inch line so I kinda have to do that first. I'm gonna mark you Three quarter there, and three quarter there, lay you down, okay, that's my three quarter inch line, and now I need to go straight across, so I got my five and a half, yeah, five and a half, 
kind of bringing that across here to this line right here. Okay. So there's five and a half, and now I can mark that straight down. That's the actual edge of my mold right there, cut here. And then I need to go up an inch and a half, and then straight up from there. So I go along this line an inch and a half, like that. So from here I gotta go straight up. Nice and square. So that is the actual shape of the mold, right there. Now I gotta do this one. So I've got my three-quarter line, and then my inch and a half goes down from this point. Inch and a half down to here. And this one goes straight across like that. So now right on over to here. Easy, right? Okay. I'm going to do the other side, draw that out, and then we can start cutting. So if you're drawing on plywood, sandpaper is basically an eraser. So that I don't accidentally try and cut where I'm not supposed to. I generally try and erase the marks I'm not supposed to be cutting on. Because I said that the plywood is generally not that expensive, but I really don't want to go out and buy more of it. I do have that extra sheet for mold number, what, eight? But uh, I'd rather keep some of that around because I do need to make uh, guides for the transoms and probably a whole bunch of other stuff. There we go, that's a drawn mold. Um, so this is number, when I say this one's 10, 2, number 2. All right, I'm going to get the jigsaw, we're going to clamp this down, and we're going to cut. So I'm not going to tell you how to use a jigsaw. Um, you should figure that out for yourself, I guess. I don't know. I don't even know what I would tell you. But uh, one important thing to do when you're uh, cutting out things like molds is don't try and go right at the line. You want to go just a little bit outside that line, a 32nd to 16th, just like this much, just a little bit. Uh, and then use something that's a little bit cleaner and more precise to bring it down to that pencil line, like that block plane that I was telling you about over there and all that clutter. That way you can take shavings off that are super, super thin, and you can just ease it right down to that line. With something big and squirrely like a, like a jigsaw or even a skill saw, um, there's a real good chance that you're going to duck in and then you're going to wind up with a line that just isn't quite right. Now, we're dealing with great big fat pieces of plywood um, that we're going to be stretching over these things and bending. Uh, so a little dip isn't going to kill you. Don't throw it out and try and do it. You know, don't, don't go and just make another one. But, you know, it, it's a really good practice to cut on the outside of the line and then trim it down with something else like a plane. Um, if you don't have a plane, I guess you could use like a file or a rasp, but there's a pain on plywood. So consider at least a little block plane like that. Um, if you're not making furniture, you're making like boat type stuff, 
a block plane will take you really far as long as you're not Steve and trying to like hog down, you know, giant pieces of center line timber. If you're making a little dink like this, get a block plane. thing we need to do is what's the next thing we need to do next thing we need to do is knock all of these rough cuts down to the lines using first our big fat electric plane and then our little black plane so I'm gonna get those ready and uh, we're gonna do that okay so I'm starting on the top edge you don't have to have an electric planer um, it just makes things a lot uh, quicker <laughs> and uh, if you're you know uh, not real used to having a block plane it, uh, it, it, it at least it gets it close to flat for you it gets real close to flat it might be honestly as close to flat as it needs to be for something like this um, it's just nice being able to sort of adjust how much you want to take off and uh, it's, it's a lot less fussy than a block plane is. It's just not as precise. And, you know, if you're making furniture and stuff or big, beautiful boat parts, um, it might leave a little bit of waviness. And if you're doing like joints that you have to glue or something like that, you, you're gonna need to finish with some kind of a plane to get that nice, super smooth finish. But right now, here we go. <laughs> this way off. Because 
This, this, and this, these are the edges that are actually bearing wood when we're assembling our boat. So those are the three that really need attention from the plane. And then in here, these notches are going to need to come down and uh, I don't have a plane that can deal with those. So I use a chisel. Um, I'm not great with the chisel, but I'll show you what I do. This one got a little close, so I'm just gonna... It done? I'm gonna chisel. So something that's gonna make your life a whole lot better is keeping your chisels sharp. I'm no expert at sharpening by any means, but what I do works for me well enough, I guess. I got a little tri-stone. I got this at like the home center. Uh, it's got a course. You should, well, the first time you sharpen a chisel, you probably need the course. Then you move on to medium, and then fine. So what I do is, after I use a chisel for a little while, I wet down my fine stone. And you know, uh, you watch Steve, he's got like this crazy guide that sort of makes the bevel absolutely perfect every time. Uh, I don't have one of those. I also don't have like, was it Lee Nielsen uh, chisels or anything? Like this one I got out of a bucket in my father-in-law's uh, basement. Uh, the ones that you saw on the wall before, those things I got at, you know, the home center for like 20 bucks. Um, the good ones probably hold an edge for longer, but you don't need crazy expensive chisels. Um, I mean, if you're building a duster, you don't need crazy expensive chisels. You need something that's going to get the job done. What I'm doing is I'm just trying to line up the bevel, get it flat on the stone, and I'll run it up and down like this. And that's going to put a nice little bit of polish on that bad boy. And what's going to happen is, as you sharpen like this, it's actually going to make a little curl of metal right here on this edge, right there. And that's fine, because the next thing we're going to do, once we've got this pit done, and flip it over, put the flat right down on the stone. I'm going to run it around a couple of times. You want to keep it as flat as you can because uh, that's what makes that bevel, this angle between this bit here and this bit here. So that's about as shiny as I think I'm going to get it with this stone. So we're going to go hit this thing with a mallet and knock that pencil line down my dinky little mallet. I mean, there's probably better ways to deal with plywood. If you've got an idea, and it's something that I've got in my garage, put it in the comments. 
because I fully acknowledge that I might be doing this wrong. Because, man, it feels like I'm doing it wrong. But it's, I mean, I'm going right across, I'm, I'm going across the half the grain, you know? So, like, it just kind of gets chewed up and torn out. And someone's going to say, buy better chisels, and I'm not going to do that. Because I'm going to blow several hundred dollars on marine plywood. Also, um, I didn't say it before, but you should also sharpen the iron in your plane, like, constantly. Especially when you're messing with plywood, because plywood dulls stuff. Because it's got layers of glue, you're going across the grain. You see what I'm doing? I'm taking this flat and I'm laying it down like this and I'm trying to slick things down and as close to flat as I can. I'm basically just using it like a plane. Just, you know, the plane that you hammer on. I call that about as close to done as it's going to get. Yeah, looks okay, right? We we'll do the next one. Oh, see, now this one's going totally the wrong way. I'm going into the grain, so I'm expecting it to split out nice and good. I don't know what do you think. Ugh. Might have dug too deep on that one. Really, I dug too deep and awakened. Creature from another age. Yeah, see how I got like a nice little dig in there? I'm not going to be super worried about it because, well, it's like a pencil line wide and I'm just this person, you know? I have a lot more time to agonize over perfect lines when I'm actually building a boat and not molds for a boat. We call that done, flip it, do it again. There's another way you can do it. Kind of slice it across. Doesn't work too well if you've got like a bunch of stuff to take off. A little bit closer on this side, so yeah. Okay, that might have been the way to do it. Sellers ever sees this video, he's gonna vomit. It's like, what are you doing, you idiot? I've shown you how to use a chisel. Sorry, Paul. Just not as cool as you. Sorry, I used power tools. Paul Sellers doesn't like power tools. Throw shade 
he throws shaded power tools all the time. Very fun to watch though. Incredibly skilled dude. So that, I'm calling it done. I'm calling this mold number two. Okay, so that's it. We've got mold number two done. So we've got two, four, six, not eight. 10 and 12, those are done, those are five. Um, I gotta make mold eight, and then I've got all the molds that I need to, um, <sighs> I've got all the molds that I need to say that the molds are done. Um, I need to make a couple of plywood supports for the bow and stern transoms, and then I need to scarf together some pieces for the strong back. Uh, the strong back is the sort of pair of rails that run parallel to each other that the molds all sit on that uh, keep everything, you know, from getting all twisty wobbly and all of that. So you have a nice solid platform to curve the boat around. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. It was probably a long video between the history and the, uh, the cutting and all of that, but we had a lot of material to cover. I know it's not the kind of thing that I usually do. Usually we're just kind of screw it around on a sailboat and, you know, uh, losing to the rest of Beefleet. fleet um, But I plan on making some more of these building videos because, uh, yeah, I'm going to build a Doster. My dream is to put together a racing fleet again, and that needs three boats. I don't think anybody else is going to want to build these things, so I'm probably going to end up building three of these boats and giving one maybe to uh, K-pop, maybe one to C-Bomb, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. And uh, yeah, stick around, do the things. Uh, if you like what you saw or you can tell me that I'm doing everything wrong, go ahead and uh, put a comment in, click on all the links and sign up for all the things. And uh, yeah, I'll see you on the next one. Bye. yourself. Messy workshop, you know, slip and fall, whoever you're cohabitating with, you'll definitely appreciate it. And uh, if you clean up after yourself when you're throwing sawdust, well you'll have a little bit more leeway when you've got things like epoxy fumes and, and tracking varnish through the house. So uh, it takes no time, sweep up, and uh, yeah, be tidy.